You know, sometimes I feel like I was born with a leak. And any goodness I started with just slowly spilled out of me, and now it's all gone. And I'll never get it back in me. It's too late. Life is a series of closing doors, isn't it? Don't be sad. Good horsey. Back in the summer of 2014, during the usual drought of quality shows, I was at a loss for something to watch. Whenever I find myself bored or just wanting background noise, I'll often rewatch a show, 30 Rock, Community, Golden Era Simpsons, The Office, Up Until Michael Leaves, Seasons 8 and 9 are a topic for another video, etc etc. Even though watching these offer some comfort and familiarity, even nostalgia, I still find myself wanting something new. It was during this time that Netflix's lineup of original shows was in its infancy, starting with House of Cards the previous year. I never really paid much attention to what they were making at the time, and I never tried House of Cards despite being told it was great, and admittedly I'm a little reluctant to try it now, all things considered. And although I started watching Orange is the New Black years after it originally aired, at the time it felt like something that wouldn't really scratch that itch. When I saw the poster for Bojack Horseman, I think like many, I thought it was yet another adult-oriented animated show, similar to the kind of show that would get cancelled after one or two seasons on Adult Swim, Comedy Central or Fox, like Brickleberry, Assy McGee, Aqua Teen Hunger Force, Mr. Pickles, uh, uh, post-renewal family guy, double uh, so on and so on, and yes, before you comment, I know some of those shows lasted more than two seasons, it was a while before I gave Bojack a try, and I think it's only because of seeing it in my recommended list every time I open Netflix that I eventually caved in and watched it. So, on a warm summer night in England, I sat down and I watched it. The first couple of episodes were pretty much what I expected, apart from the fact that a lot of the cast were anthropomorphic animals and not just Bojack. The characters were initially what I expected from the show. A surly but lovable drunk, a slacker stoner, a highly strong overachiever, the well-meaning but not so bright friend, and the voice of reason. But as I kept watching it, it was slowly winning me over. And eventually, through some alchemy, it all started to come together, and I realized I was falling in love with it. Which is why I can say, after five seasons and an upcoming six, without a shadow of a doubt, that Bojack Horseman is the best show Netflix has ever produced. No, seriously. Bojack is brilliant. Even the CEO of Netflix said that it's his favorite show. So, if you'll give me a moment, allow me to explain why you should watch Bojack Horseman, the most depressing cartoon ever made. So to give you a quick synopsis of the show, Bojack Horseman is a comedy based around its titular character. Bojack is a once famous actor who now lives in the Hollywood Hills, getting by on the royalties of Horsin' Around, a cheesy 90s sitcom in which he was a star and played the adoptive father of three children. Since then, Bojack hasn't been able to find more work in the industry, so he spends his days fading into obscurity with his roommate Todd. He's in a complicated relationship with his agent, Princess Carolyn, who endeavours endlessly to find Bojack work within an industry that hasn't forgotten about him, but can only remember him as a 90s sitcom dad. The show's premise is somewhat basic, but this is what makes it fertile ground in which the characters can grow and change. I'm going to try and go into what makes Bojack Horseman a great show, and I'll do my best without trying to spoil anything, but at the end of the video I might enter spoiler territory, but of course if I do, I'll let you know before I do. Bojack Horseman is, at its heart, a comedy. At times it can be knowingly absurd or on the nose, and at other times it can rival a show like Arrested Development in its wit. I think the one thing that makes it special is the fact that it can go between so many tones so seamlessly, and bringing the audience along with it without feeling jarring or out of place, and boy does Bojack Horseman switch tones. Do you... Do you think it's too late for me? What? I mean, am, am, am 
am I just doomed to be the person that I am, the, the person in that book? I mean, it's, it's not too late for me, is it? It's, it's not too late. Diane, I need you to tell me that it's not too late. This moment right here is when I fell in love with the show. After everything you've seen before it, this show and its zany madcap characters with all its absurdity delivers this absolutely heartbreaking moment. This moment comes at the end of Season 1, Episode 11, appropriately titled Downer Ending. Like I said, the writers love their fair share of on-the-nose jokes. Before this, Bojack and his roommate Todd and old co-star Sarah Lynn went on a drug-fueled binge lasting for days. During this, Bojack imagines a life that he could have had with Charlotte, a woman he befriended not long after starting his career in comedy. Charlotte grew tired of Hollywood and moved away. Bojack stayed and became the person that he is today. Charlotte didn't want Bojack to become corrupted by Hollywood and the last time Bojack was happy was when he was around her. Bojack is terrified that he's simply doomed as a person, that losing Charlotte all those years ago meant losing the only connection he had to the world before he became corrupted by Hollywood. Diane is now essentially a visitor from a world outside of Hollywood, and he's desperate, truly desperate to know whether someone like her, a normal person, is able to see him as good. The answer lings in the air for what feels like an eternity. And then we hear the sound of the life that Bojack could have had, a sound which haunts him. Bojack is broken. I admire any show, movie, book, or game that handles its story like this. When handled poorly, it can result in emotional whiplash where you're not sure how to feel or how you got from point A to point B in such a short amount of time. Bojack has laid the groundwork for this the entire season though. You see his alcohol and drug abuse, his inability to hold down a relationship and connect with people, his resentment towards those who come by happiness so easily. And most importantly, we see glimpses into his childhood and learn that Bojack is a victim of abuse from his parents. Two people who are also broken in their own way. That's why this moment feels earned. And it's why Bojack Horseman has one of, if not the best portrayals of depression out there. And it's been represented by a cartoon horse. Insert your own wide long face joke here, I guess. And this is just the first season. Bojack Horseman is a rare example of a show that's only gotten better with each new season, and given that it's five seasons in with a six on the way, that's no small feat. The show isn't all about Bojack though, each character gets their time in the spotlight, and I think to understand what makes the show so great, it's worth analysing what makes them so interesting and how we learn about them over time. So let's start with the obvious choice, Bojack. You might think that Bojack is supposed to be kind of like a lovable bastard type character, much like Rick Sanchez, Dr. House, Sherlock, etc. And you'd be forgiven for thinking so, but Bojack is just kind of a bastard. Throughout the show, he does plenty of bad things, both to himself and to other people. He's selfish, entitled, narcissistic, angry, lazy. He hates honeydew melon, even though it's arguably the best melon. And he seems to hate everyone around him. Most importantly though, it's that Bojack is self-destructive. And the show goes through painstaking efforts to show you how a person like Bojack comes into being. There's no way of dancing around this, but Bojack was a victim of parental abuse as a child. His parents were both bitter, angry people who resented each other for destroying each other's dreams. Bojack ended up having to carry their burden from as long as he could remember, essentially being forced into a career in entertainment and having to endure the constant barrage of insults, humiliation and shame from his mother and father who maintained a constant emotional distance. Bojack grew up not really knowing who he is or what he wants out of life, but if there's one thing that the show makes very clear is that he, like everyone else, wants love and validation from others. And even though he was on one of the most popular sitcoms of the 90s, called Horsin' Around, despite him being recognisable and having his work loved by thousands upon thousands of people, it's simply not the validation that he needs. And it most definitely isn't love. 
It's also his fame that potentially keeps him from being recognized or even loved in a way that he wants, because people only see that horse from that sitcom, not really a human being or horse. And although I have no way of knowing this, it does make me wonder if celebrities have these thoughts, especially ones who are recognizable to practically everyone. I'd probably wonder, can anyone in this world see me beyond what I do as an actor? I think if I was in that position, I might feel that way. How people perceive you as an average person brings all kind of anxiety. We're constantly told how first impressions matter, but what if that first impression has already been made for you thanks to your fame? How could you change what someone thinks of you when they've already seen you on TV dozens, possibly hundreds of times before? Bojack suffers from what's commonly referred to as the Hedgehog's Dilemma, a term coined by philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer, and if you're familiar with Neon Genesis Evangelion, you probably know what I'm talking about. Bojack wants to be close to other people, but he's afraid of both being hurt by them and hurting them. He'll sometimes try to justify why he had to hurt someone, but it's something that affects him and makes him worry that he'll never be a good person. Hurt people hurt people. Bojack grew with a parental dynamic that damaged his ability to create relationships with everyone around him. He so badly wants to be loved by someone, but he doesn't even know what it is to be loved. His parents were supposed to love him, but all they ever did was put him down and hurt him, so now he does the same to others. Bojack isn't the only one who wonders if he's a bad person. The show makes the audience wonder too, but it also raises a question. Is his bad behavior something that's beyond his control? Was he raised in such a way that there's no point to being good because it doesn't result in receiving love? And honestly, I think it's the latter. There's a moment in the show where we see Bojack as a child watching his hero, Secretariat, on a talk show and he's fortunate enough to have a letter that he sent in read to him. He asks what he can do to escape sadness, and Secretariat essentially tells him that he has to run away from his problems. This is a profound moment in Bojack's life, one which echoes throughout the entire show, but it's also damaging to him because it's part of what keeps him from forming any real relationships, because he's not willing to address his problems and those stay with him no matter how far he runs. Just to hammer the point home, shortly after we see the interview with Secretariat, we learn that he was caught betting on his own races, and rather than face the embarrassment, he decides to take his own life. It can be often at times frustrating watching Bojack grow and sabotage himself over and over again, but living with trauma can make growing as a person extraordinarily difficult and that frustration is what Bojack lives with every day. His frustration becomes ours, and we want him to get better, we believe that he can be better, but changing can feel impossible when you were never given the tools to do so. To put it simply, Bojack is one of the best written and performed tragic characters of modern times. single-handedly got a lady footlocker store employee a primetime show and resurrected a certified dead man and nobody cared. Why do I do anything? It's no secret that the world of showbiz is a cutthroat place. There are literally thousands upon thousands of people out in Hollywood looking to make it in some way or another. Princess Carolyn is an agent or manager or a don't know the difference, you'll, you'll get that joke eventually, or now if you've already seen the show. More specifically, she's Bojack's longtime agent who endlessly struggles to find him work while trying to maintain a platonic relationship with him at arm's length. She's a dynamo, constantly working seemingly every hour she's awake, trying to make the magic happen. As a result, Princess Carolyn doesn't really have any kind of life to speak of. She doesn't have a partner, lives alone in a swanky apartment, and finds it hard to connect with others in any kind of honest way anymore. At times it can feel a little tough to watch this person who is honestly trying her best to get the best results for other people, but we're reminded on occasion that everything that she does is ultimately for herself, and while she's not a selfish person, she is ultimately out for herself. 
Much like a cat, she's individualistic and goes after whatever she wants, which can make it all the more crushing when she can't get it, especially when that thing is something that could improve her life outside of work. Much like Bojack, Princess Carolyn has a void to fill. The difference between them though is she'd rather deny it, and continue believing that investing in her professional life is the answer. Both characters are self-destructive. Bojack fills a void with alcohol and drugs, Princess Carolyn fills it with work. The makers of the show clearly have a lot of love for the character, as there are a handful of episodes dedicated almost entirely to her. We learn that she came from pretty much nothing, but she had a lot of incentives to stay that way, and it leaves us to wonder if she would have been happier had she not left to pursue her career in Hollywood, or even if something completely different would have been better. She's had to manage people all her life, but in the process neglects herself. I think the truly tragic thing about Princess Carolyn is that she always seems just a couple steps away from happiness, and although a lot of the time it's circumstances beyond her control that keep her from this, it's her reluctance to try again that keeps her from pushing even further out of fear of getting hurt. The universe is a cruel, uncaring void. The key to being happy isn't the search for meaning, it's to just keep yourself busy with unimportant nonsense, and eventually, you'll be dead. Well, uh, I guess I can keep my options open. Great! <whistles> Mr. Peanut Butter is in some ways Bojack's rival, but he doesn't see himself as that. True to his canine nature, he's an optimistic, high-energy, lovable individual who only wants to share his positivity with the world. Much like Bojack, he's had a successful sitcom in the 90s, which came about after the growing popularity of Horsin' Around, and from what we can tell, it never quite reached the same heights of success, but it managed to make Mr. Peanut Butter a household name. He lives in the Hollywood Hills with his partner Diane, a newcomer to Hollywood who is ostensibly a person from the real world outside of the world of entertainment. From the outset of the show, it can feel like Mr. Peanut Butter exists purely as an antithesis to Bojack, almost as though he's the person Bojack could have been had he not been dealt such a bad hand in life, and to an extent, he is. Mr. Peanut Butter hasn't really had to deal with trauma, at least to the extent that Bojack has, and despite the fact that Bojack's depression was a time bomb, his terrible upbringing undoubtedly contributed to the person he became. As you might expect, Bojack has his fair share of resentment towards Mr. Peanut Butter. Being face to face with the person that you could have been has to be a painful experience. However, Mr. Peanut Butter wears his heart on his sleeve, probably more than any other character in the show. He knows who he is and what he wants, and that's to be happy and make other people happy and unfortunately that brings about its own conflict. What does someone like Mr. Peanut Butter do when he tries to make people happy who don't want to be happy? That in itself would be upsetting, but Mr. Peanut Butter is a relatively simple person and simple things make him happy. For other people in his life, achieving happiness is far more complicated. It's either far too complex or they don't know how to achieve it. Mr. Peanut Butter endlessly tries to make everyone happy, and although he manages to do this on many occasions, especially with his adoring fans, when he can't please the people closest to him, it becomes all the more frustrating. Compared to the other characters in the show, he's not as deep and his backstory isn't as laden with tragedy, but he's far more than just a rival to Bojack, even though it may not seem that way at first glance. Mr. Peanut Butter is a dog that we wish we could all be, but he also serves as a reminder that to be truly happy, you have to know sadness, even if it's just a little bit. What do I do now? Well, that's the problem with life, right? Either you know what you want, and then you don't get what you want, or you get what you want, and then you don't know what you want. Well, that's stupid. Yeah. <sighs> Diane Nguyen... Nguyen... Nguyen? Nguyen. Nguyen, okay, it's Nguyen. As mentioned before, Diane is an outsider in Hollywood, but being an outsider isn't something that's new to her. She grew up in a Vietnamese-American family in Boston. She's the youngest sister of four brothers, one of which is adopted. They're all loud, brash, and obsessed with sports, while Diane is... not. 
She's a socially conscious third wave feminist who's quiet and reserved and often finds it difficult to speak up for herself. And although she's opinionated, she often struggles to find her own voice. Incidentally, Bojack and Diane become acquainted when she's hired as his ghostwriter for his autobiography in the first season. You could argue that Diane is our stand-in as the audience since she's unfamiliar with the world of showbiz, but I think saying that would be doing her a disservice. Yes, we learn about this world the way she does, but she's so much more than that. She does her best to retain her humanity in an industry which it can often feel like humanity has no place. Diane often struggles with retaining her own agency though. Being the girlfriend of Mr. Peanut Butter often makes her feel like she's just that, a girlfriend. Someone who happens to appear in photographs with a celebrity. And since Mr. Peanut Butter is such a larger than life character, she feels like background dressing to the theater performance that is his life. Diane is at odds with herself. It's clear that she wants recognition and validation of some sorts, but also doesn't want to be in the limelight. And speaking from a personal level, I get this. I also came from a family where I was the quietest and although I would often try my hardest to get recognition from my parents, it would still for some reason bother me when I did. Because I was so used to being in the background that when I finally did get noticed, I didn't know what to do or how to react to it. It's a contradiction that could be hard to cope with, a need for validation paired with a need to avoid it. As a result, Dan doesn't really know what she wants. Mr. Peanut Butter has a lot of love for her, as he does with everyone else. But that also becomes a problem for Diane because not only does she not know how to react to it, she worries that she can't reciprocate it. I always thought the creators of the show making her a ghostwriter as an occupation was a great choice. I can't think of any other career which better encapsulates a personality like Diane's. It's her writing that brings Bojack to life constructed through her lens and despite the book being successful she doesn't really get any recognition for it. The closest she gets is a ghostwriter panel I mentioned at the beginning. Diane got out of Boston and got away from the family which she was alienated from but she's still an alien. She wants a place to belong and people who make her feel like she belongs. She just doesn't know how to achieve that or even if it's possible. Wait, is this going to be like that time you promised to take me ice skating? I got really excited about the ice skating, but then instead of ice skating, you left me at home so you could go to the strip club and then you took the strippers ice skating? No. Then hooray! Todd is quite possibly the simplest character in the show. He's friendly, easygoing, and lovable to everyone. In the first season, we're introduced to him as Bojack's slacker roommate who lives on the couch, stays at home, and gets high all day. But I think over time the writers decided to change that up a little. And not to paint him as just a complacent, goofy stoner who exists as a polar opposite to Bojack's constant worrying, and this was definitely a change for the better. Without doubt, Todd is the show's comedic relief, and the writers are very aware of this. On numerous occasions, it's pointed out by other characters how he somehow seems to land himself in wacky predicaments that always seem to work out in the end, and the absurdity of these situations are about as on the nose as you can get, especially in Season 4, Episode 3, which is titled Hooray, a Todd episode, which is literally just a series of madcap events involving Todd, and it's great seeing the writers have fun with a character like this. Even though they're fully aware of the ridiculousness of these situations, it never feels like they're being overly ironic or that they're constantly winking at the audience like it's an in-joke. Todd might not carry copious amounts of emotional baggage like the other characters do, but when the time is right, the show gives him moments of vulnerability and they land just as well as any other character. I think part of what makes this work so well is because we're conditioned to see him as comic relief and therefore it's easy to forget that he's still a person with his own thoughts and feelings and he's still capable of being hurt. In season 1 episode 4, Todd decides to follow through with a lifelong dream of creating a rock opera. Bojack at first mocks Todd, points out the fact that he's a failure with no prospects and a freeloader, but later changes his mind and encourages Todd to go ahead with it. Later on when Todd actually comes close to success with it, Bojack ends up sabotaging him out of fear that he'll end up moving out and leave him alone in his house. 
Todd is heartbroken, especially since this sabotage was partially self-inflicted, but he's able to move past it due to his relentless optimism. There's a spoiler coming up here, so if you want to skip ahead, go to this time, um, or keep watching if you don't care. I'm not a cop, do what you want with your life. Bleh. In a later episode, we learn about Todd's relationship with his old friend Emily, who at first we're supposed to think is an old flame. They get along with each other, they clearly are very close and care about each other, and they're both single. It becomes apparent there's something keeping them from engaging in an intimate relationship, and then it's revealed, Todd is asexual. I'm not gay. I mean, I don't think I am, but I don't think I'm straight either. I don't know what I am. I think I might be nothing. Oh, well, that's okay. Yeah? Yeah, of course. The moment is handled perfectly, with two friends coming to an understanding and even though it's something that Todd has felt all his life, it's something he's never been able to put a label on, and he has to figure out what this means for him and his future relationships. It also means that he and Emily have to figure out how their relationship will work from now on, since they both love each other, but only one of them wants to take that to a sexual level. Representations of asexuals in media, especially television and movies, are lacking, to say the least and the majority of characters who fit the bill are largely assumed asexual, like Sherlock Holmes and Doctor Who. Todd is literally the first openly asexual character on television. Seriously, it took until 2017 for this to happen, and it's handled wonderfully. Representation in media is always a great thing, and although Todd offers a lot of comic relief in Bojack Horseman, this moment is handled lovingly. It doesn't feel like it was thrown in by the writers at the last moment either. They were clearly building up to this moment throughout the entire season, and they stick the landing perfectly. So after hearing all this, you're probably thinking that Bojack Horseman is a pretty depressing show, and yeah, admittedly, at times it can be downright heartbreaking to watch, but the truly tragic moments only make up about 5% of the show, but there are moments that resonate throughout, and they're so important to understand each of the characters' actions and how they think and feel, even during the times when we're laughing. The show is a comedy, and it's a damn good one at that. Even when the show is talking about real-world issues like gun control, mass shootings, pro-choice, the hashtag MeToo movement, and even elections, they're still able to broach the subject with levity, and they never approach it with the obnoxious cynicism of a show like South Park. And yes, the show gets political at times. If you don't like that, grow up. Politics is everywhere and it's in everything. Like I said earlier, the show loves to embrace the absurd. And the times which you would expect a typical comedy trope, they lean into it hard. There's a few episodes where they have flashbacks and they go out of their way to reference as many things as possible from that year. J.D. Salinger is found alive and well, and despite the fact that he's the author that made a career out of calling out phoniness in people, he makes a TV quiz show dedicated to learning more about celebrities called Hollywood Stars and Celebrities. What do they know? Do they know things? Let's find out. Yes, that is the full name of the show. They even do an almost entire episode that plays out like a silent film, where no one can talk and the only things we hear are the music and diegetic sound, and it plays out wonderfully. From my own personal perspective though, I love that the show takes the time to explore the tragedy in its characters. Admittedly, I love a lot of things which are depressing. Some of my favourite movies, music, games and TV shows can be really depressing, and that's because they speak to me on a personal level. I've suffered from depression and anxiety for as long as I can remember. I have good days and bad days, and even writing and recording this video was hard because I find it hard to build up the motivation to do anything at times. I see myself in many of the characters in Bojack Horseman more than I'd like to admit at times, and although part of learning to understand yourself is through introspection, it can be really helpful to see how other characters deal with hardships you're familiar with, even if they are fictional characters or anthropomorphic animals. Fictional characters don't always have to be 
aspirational role models or a beacon of positivity. Entertainment can be escapism, but art makes you think about yourself and the world around you. And Bojack makes me do that. It makes me wonder how I can be a good person, how I can get better, how I need to try and stop making the same mistakes, but not be angry at myself when I do, and how even though you can't change where you came from, you can work to change your future. Raphael Bob Waxberg has created one of the greatest animated shows of all time, and the best show on Netflix. It's made me laugh more times than I can count, and it made me shed a tear more times than I can count. He recently released a book of short stories called Someone Will Love You In All Your Damaged Glory, and really, that's what Bojack Horseman is about. Some of these characters are damaged, but not in the Suicide Squad Joker kind of way. Speaking of which, one of the best jokes is the show is about Jared Leto, but I won't spoil it for you. But they all want to be loved, even if they don't know what kind of love they want or how to go about getting it. And I think that's something pretty much anyone can relate to. Not necessarily the love of a romantic companion, but just someone who you know cares and thinks about you and wants nothing but the best for you and you for them. They may have done some self-destructive, even downright awful things, but they still deserve love, and they all want to be better. So, thank you to everyone who made Bojack Horseman, a show about anthropomorphic animals who are more human than most characters on television. It gets easier. Huh? Every day it gets a little easier. Yeah? But you gotta do it every day. That's the hard part. But it does get easier. <sighs> Okay. So if you made it to the end of this video, then thank you so much for watching it. I really appreciate it. This is my first video that I've put together and it was quite a big task for me. Um, I really love Bojack Horseman. It's a great show and it was actually just announced today, um, September 27th, that the upcoming season is going to be released on October 25th and it's actually going to be the final season of it. I'll be sad to see the show go but it's better than for it to drag on indefinitely and you know end up with something that's unrecognizable by the end and speaking of which my next episode is more than likely going to be on the American office and what happened to it, where it all went wrong. It's always been a fascinating subject to me um, thank you so much uh, once again. If you wouldn't mind liking and subscribing to my channel, um, or liking this video and subscribing to my channel, you know what I mean. Um, that would be much appreciated. Uh, hopefully I'll be able to get the next video out pretty soon. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, once again, thank you very much. It means a lot to me that you took your time out to watch this. Uh, have a good day and I'll figure out some kind of way to end videos properly in the future, hopefully. Bye-bye.